Hello, I'm Hugh Whitmore. Welcome to the One True Church. Today's Bible teaching is entitled, The Name of the Antichrist is... And that name is Paul. Yes, that Paul, the Paul of the Bible, Saul of Tarsus, the murderer of Christians, the false apostle who wrote a big chunk of the New Testament. But it isn't that easy because Paul is more like the father of Antichrists because there can't be just one Antichrist. Because Antichrist isn't physical. It's a spirit that arises from the physical actions of millions of people, which fits with a major theme of the Bible. God set up his plan of eternal salvation, and to fulfill this plan, the physical must become the spiritual, in that our works create spiritual energy, which the Bible calls glory, and it glorifies God to his purposes, which I'll explain as I go along here in the teaching. So let's start with the basics on Antichrist. The word Antichrist is only mentioned four times in the Bible in John's epistles, and not in Revelation where you think you'd see it. And here are the four. 1 John 2.18 Little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. That was then, 2,000 years ago. There are many. 1 John 2.22 Who is a liar but he that denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. 2 John 1, 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world who do not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. 1 John 4, 3. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of antichrist, which you have heard that it should come And even now, already, it is in the world. So, John says here that Antichrist is a spirit. But I'm going to start with the physical reasons Paul is the father of Antichrists before we move to the spiritual effect of those physical actions. The physical being, of course, the works of Paul. So that we can parallel God's plan of eternal salvation and see why the Antichrist spirit counters that in the world. Okay, of the Antichrist, John said in 1 John 2.19, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they no doubt would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Paul was one of those who went out. And what's interesting here is that John says they went out to be made manifest, which just means made to be known. And this is one major way we know Paul is false, because those who run the world run their rituals for Satan right out in the open. And in the modern times, people call this hiding in plain sight, which is what Paul did in his push to take over the church. He went out and made himself manifest, which is a physical indicator of being antichrist. Paul said in Galatians 1, 16, 17, that after God called him, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. So, as John said, Paul went out from the real apostles in the literal sense as Paul exited the region after his fake miracle conversion. And by the way, Paul was not an apostle. Short digression here. Jesus picked 12 apostles to match the sacred number 12 that matches the 12 tribes of Israel. And Jesus promised the real 12 apostles that they would be given a reward in heaven in Matthew 19, 28. In the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. To suggest a 13th apostle is preposterous. When the real apostles picked a replacement, they had a list of criteria, and it included that the candidate had to have been with Jesus from the baptism of John all the way through to the ascension, and Paul had none of those qualifications. So to repeat, Paul literally went out from the others, and figuratively he went out from the others because of his false teachings. 
which John addresses in 1 John 2, 22. Who is a liar but he that denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. And Paul denies both God and Jesus by making up his own commandments that deny the commandments of God and Jesus. Because God and Jesus taught the same eternal principles. Paul changed those. In Matthew 5.32, Jesus said, Everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. So, Jesus said basically, no divorce except for sexual immorality. In 1 Corinthians 7, 12-14, Paul says, To the rest I say this, I, not the Lord. So here Paul is making his own commandment. If any brother has a wife who is not a believer, and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer, and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. You know, first of all, if Paul was a follower of the Christ, why wouldn't he just say Jesus had spoken on the matter? Why would he make up his own commandment? Plus, the idea that one person can be sanctified by another is crazy. It's nuts. You can't be sanctified by proximity or by magic. You can only be sanctified by your own actions. But it even gets worse with Paul because on the marriage situation, he says in verse 15, but if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. So it's neither here nor there to Paul. Huh, just dump the spouse and upgrade. That's what people do, right? Paul did that also with sacrificing food to idols. He said it was neither here nor there. This is the denial of God and Jesus and his Antichrist. Along these lines, an interesting theme in the Bible is the real-time battle between the real apostles and Paul in the first century that ends up in the Bible. In James 2.18, James says, But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith by my works. This is a direct slap at Paul, because Paul pretends in his writings that the physical relationship God requires by works is instead a matter of faith rather than of obedience. Notably with Abraham, when God told Abraham to kill his son Isaac. Paul says in Hebrews 11:17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. But when you read Genesis 22, 1 to 18, where God makes Abraham do this murderous chore, faith is not mentioned once. Abraham just goes to do it. And with the knife in the air, an angel appears and says in Genesis 22:12, 12, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God. Not I know that you have faith in God. Fear God, which is born of obedience. And in verses 16 to 18, the angel says, Because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you. And then in verse 18, because you have obeyed my voice. Here, God's method of requiring the physical by way of works becomes the spiritual as God rewards those works of Abraham with a blessing. Paul, by his lying about God's laws and by twisting God's eternal word, denies God and his Antichrist. And Paul does this on another level by denying the eternal salvation plan that God sent with Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17, 18, that he had not come to abolish the law and that every bit of the law would remain in effect for the Jews until all was accomplished, and by all he meant the return of the kingdom. The law was sacred to obedient Jews, but Paul disdained the law and denied it. Paul said in Hebrews 10.4, It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins, which is false, and it refers to the method of animal sacrifice God set up for Israel to atone for their sins. And the law also has specific instructions on how to take away sins once they are committed in Leviticus 5, 6. He shall bring to the Lord as his compensation for the sin that he has committed, a female from the flock, a lamb or goat for a sin offering. 
And those caught up in the Paul deception always spout off with this cultural saying that has come from Paul's false testimony. If the law took away the sins, we never would have needed a Jesus or a Savior. But of course the law took away sins. That's what the law was there for. And Paul is denying God's plan of eternal salvation for the Hebrews by this lie, very much a denial of God and Antichrist. God made manifest the power of the law by putting the Ten Commandments in stone tablets and placing those tablets in the Ark of the Covenant, which was God's most sacred object. Paul, speaking blasphemy in 2 Corinthians 3, 7, called the law the ministry of death carved in letters on stone. This is Paul denying the Ten Commandments, which God made and Jesus confirmed, which denies God and Jesus and his Antichrist. Paul continued his habit of quoting Old Testament scripture deceitfully by calling the law a curse in Galatians 3.13. But when Moses received the law from God and gave it to Israel, he actually said, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. That's Deuteronomy 11.26. The law was a blessing if you followed it and obeyed it, and a curse if you defied it, which makes perfect sense for the benefits and punishments inherent in God's commands for his law of eternal salvation. So, Paul denies salvation of the law for the Jews. But of course, Paul denied salvation for the Gentiles as well by taking the works-based salvation Jesus taught that God gave him and replaced it with a free gift of grace, which is a lie. Grace does not bring salvation, and it draws you away from the physical actions of works that become spirit, a spirit that glorifies God to his purposes. Another biblical support that Paul is a father of the Antichrist spirit comes from the prophet Daniel. In Daniel 7.25, where Daniel is talking about a powerful person who will help usher in the eventual end of the world, he says he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. Paul, by his false testimony, speaks great words against the Most High. Paul wears out the saints because the saints are waiting for the return of Jesus because of Paul's false testimony keeping Jesus away. The book of Revelation has several references to the patience of the saints, if you want to research that. Paul also changes the laws because he destroyed the law of Moses and took away salvation for the Jews. And combined with his false testimony of making faith and grace out to be God's vehicles of salvation, Paul has literally changed the times, which means the actual time of history. Because without Paul's false gospel, the kingdom teachings of Jesus would have glorified God and the world would have ended 2,000 years ago. So those are some of the physical actions that show Paul is the Antichrist. And Paul's physical actions against God go far beyond what I've covered here because Paul's physical actions have created a separate religion apart from God and Jesus, and religions create spiritual energy, which the Bible calls glory once again, because as I said, God requires the physical to become the spiritual, and the spiritual nature of Antichrist is where we're going now with John's testimony. Here's what John says about Antichrist as spirit. 1 John 4, 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God because many false prophets are gone out into the world. 2. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. 3. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, where have you heard that it should come, and even now already it is in the world the first thing that jumps out at me here, of course, is that the Antichrist spirit is already in the world. John said so. That's 2,000 years ago, so it's a done deal. It isn't something new or something we're waiting for, so you don't have to worry about it when you see all these sensationalists say Antichrist is coming every year. And the second thing that strikes me is that it's not physical. It's not a person. It's a spirit. And so we get to the crux of the matter as we've moved again from the physical of Paul's works that are false and antichrist to the spiritual 
as God's law is designed to take us. To repeat my premise today, Antichrist is a spirit. It's a force. It's like electricity or electromagnetic radiation. It's not flesh, not a human or humans. It's generated by the ritual actions of humans. But Antichrist is a powerful unseen force. Unfortunately, it's uniformly said in public that Antichrist is a man, a man who's coming at some point in the near future every year, right? You hear that. And it's said like this to keep you on a string and keep you from the truth that Antichrist is a spirit that's already in the world. Every U.S. president, for example, is called the Antichrist, especially the one you didn't vote for, right? And those phony rigged elections they have. Prince William in England is a big one lately, the last few years that people are saying is the Antichrist. The former president of Iran was a big one. But by definition, Antichrist can't be a single man or woman because it's a force. And it's a secondary force created by men by their ritual, physical actions that become spiritual energy that glorifies Satan and denies the Christ. And the spiritual force has been created by Paul's false writings because over a billion would-be Christians unwittingly follow his teachings as a false teacher, a false apostle, and he's planted right there in their Bibles. Of course, where else would a false apostle, a false teacher be but in the Bible? Otherwise, you wouldn't believe him. Another important theme out of the Bible is that God created his method of salvation by works for the purpose of having the physical become spiritual. It's a theme. It's all through the Bible. This is a tough one for Christians to accept, but once you accept it, you see it everywhere in the Bible. And you can watch my video, Are Christians Spiritual Beings, for all the scripture. It's a long video, but it'll change your spiritual life. So this method of God's eternal salvation, making the physical become spiritual, started with the physical works of the Law of Moses, especially the animal sacrifices, which absolved sins and created spiritual energy that glorified God. And glory is God's manifested energy, His shown or visible energy. David said in Psalm 29.1, Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty, give unto the Lord glory and strength. So we glorify and strengthen God by our works. Later in the Bible story, when Israel rejected the law, God sent Jesus with the kingdom teachings that were meant for the same purpose, to do works to create glorifying energy for God. This is the physical becoming the spiritual. Paul's false testimony of grace, which is salvation by magic, denies God's plan of eternal salvation, which is a denial of God and Jesus and his Antichrist. John wrote in Revelation 1.6 of Jesus, who has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. John shows we glorify God. And supporting this, later in Revelation 4.11, when the elders before the throne worship Jesus, they say, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. And that receipt of power is not from God. It's from the people worshiping him around the throne. This is the task we have as believers, to be as priests unto God, to give spiritual energy or glory to God through our worship. Evidence of this requirement is all throughout the Bible. Like in Revelation 12.10, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. These things often repeat through the Bible. Psalm 29.1 with David, Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Right here, salvation and strength and the kingdom. The kingdom's back, of course. It hadn't been back when David was around. It's back in the future. It hasn't happened. It's a prophecy. This means a new strength and a new power in Revelation to God and Jesus because the story of Revelation is the story of God becoming fully glorified by the works of his believers. You know, in this modern world, I miss going to church. I used to love the music and the fellowship, and my daughter was a worship leader for many years, and I used to go to the church and listen to her sing. But now I know that the two false churches, Catholic and Protestant, are huge resonating power grids for the Antichrist spirit by their teaching of Paul. This is partly why I have my YouTube channel and teach here so that I can have a place where people who no longer can go to church can seek the truth in the absence of the negative influences of the false churches. So 
I call Paul the Antichrist because Paul has done more to create the Antichrist spirit than any other human being because two billion Christians follow him rather than Jesus and God. But of course, it's more accurate to say that Paul is the father of Antichrists or basically the father of the Antichrist force because it's just as Satan is the father of all lies and all those lies create an Antichrist force because Paul's false testimony stops the physical from becoming the spiritual and keeps us waiting for the kingdom from century to century. Our job as believers in God and his Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, is to turn from the easy but false path Paul offers and turn to the incredibly hard physical job of constant obedient works for God. And that physical effort will become spiritual and God will become fully glorified and we will all live in eternity with Jesus.